So hello again, my name is Christy Craig. I'm the publisher at Hidden Timber Books and I'm so happy to have you all here today along with Gail Hosking to read from her poetry book, Retrieval, which is published by Main Street Rag Press. Um, before we officially start the reading, um, I just wanna say a little bit about the, this series. The Small Press Author Reading Series started um, with COVID-19 when things were starting to be canceled. And um, I wanted to provide a platform for small press authors to share their work with readers, even while we can't get face to face in brick and mortar stores. And it's morphed into an opportunity to really spotlight stories that you probably um, won't see in the mainstream. So I've been taking a little bit of time at the beginning of each reading to just introduce you all to different books or links that you might check out that, um, coincide with current events. And as you know, there are um, protests all over the nation. I was just sharing with Gail that last night there was a midnight protest that came through the main thoroughfare by our house. And it was, it was pretty cool. It was well organized. I thought, wow, it's a great time of day to do that because they're going to get a lot more attention than just in the afternoon on a weekday. So um, there's a lot to be paying attention to. And a book that's going to be out in the fall, it's called Black in the Middle, and it's pub it's going to be published by Belt Publishing, which is another small press, and they have um, put out several different anthologies about different parts of the country, including the <laughs> Milwaukee, a Milwaukee anthology. And um, this book, Black in the Middle, brings together several different voices from Black Midwesterners to talk about their experience in the area and to, as they say, um, give voices to, to too often gone unacknowledged people and their stories. So um, just to share with you the cover, because I don't have it yet, I've ordered the book, but I don't have it. And I would love for you to um, at least take a look at it and check it out. It's edited by Terry on Williamson. It also includes a piece by Lindsay Ellis, who is the author that we will be publishing in May of 2021. She has a novel that's coming out with Hidden Timber Books. So um, I'm excited to read this anthology. I think it's going to be a wealth of information and I'll put the link in the chat box so you can check it out as well. So um, with that in mind, I want to introduce Gail. Um, Gail Hosking. She has her book of poetry called Retrieval with Main Street Rag Press. She is a poet and an essayist. She's the author of the memoir, Snake's Daughter, The Roads In and Out of War. She's published in several magazines and journals, including the Florida Review, Wax Wing, and Essay. And one of her essays was Most Notable and Best American Essays, which is another great anthology that comes out every year. So I'm thrilled to have you here, Gail. Again, if anyone has any technical troubles, you can send me a note in the chat, chat box. Um, if you don't mind keeping your microphones on mute while Gail is reading and we're having some discussions, then when we get to the Q&A, um, you can let me know in the chat box that you've got a question and you can unmute at that time. And I'll be leaving links in the chat box for you to check out as well. So I will hand the baton to you, Gail. Thank you, Christy. Um, it's strange because I can just see myself and you. And so family, friends, and strangers are out there. Um, and I'm not sure who, but um, thank you for showing up. Thank you also to Christy for doing this. Um, small presses are, uh, you know, in the hierarchy of literature are not at the top. So it's always nice to have that recognized. I also wanted to thank uh, Rachel Hall, who's in my writing group, uh, for hooking me up with Christy and telling me about the series. And also to the editor at, um, at Main Street Bragg Press, M. Scott Douglas for accepting the book. Um, thank you also to Sarah Freely who helped me edit the book. Uh, one of uh, my original teachers in creative writing and uh, now a colleague. And then also to Andy Knapp who uh, took the photograph and generously, generously um, said I could use it. It's a picture taken um, down the road from a monastery near a, a school where I taught one summer in India, up in, up in the Himalayas, uh, taught creative writing from anywhere from first grade to high school. Um, yeah, and I liked, the thing I liked about the picture is 
that retrieval really means about going back to find things and maybe even the unknown. And this is kind of goes around a corner, very foggy. Um, and those are all Buddhist flags. And since many of these poems are about <clears throat> my father during the Vietnam War time, um, he got very interested in Buddhism towards the end of his life and actually sent his daughters um, Buddha necklaces and insisted we wear them. Um, so uh, I once had a conversation with a, a teacher of mine at Bennington who thought that I might be a one subject woman. And that of course scared me because I write a lot about war and its aftermath for families. Um, but then I came across this quote from the author Maggie Nelson in her book, The Argonauts, um, which sort of turned my thinking around. Um, and also I've spoken with other writers about this. Um, she says, the she wrote, the pleasure of recognizing that one has to undergo the same realization, write the same notes in the margin, return to the same themes in one's work, relearn the same emotional truths, write the same book over and over again, not because one is stupid or obstinate or incapable of change, but because such visitations constitute a life. <clears throat> Um, as Christy said, I, I write essays. Mostly that's what I've been interested in. But when I was at Bennington, the Bennington Writing Seminars, studying creative nonfiction, uh, the poet Jane Hirschfield came and gave a series of uh, lectures on poetry. And I was just smitten with poetry. I thought, how did I, how did I miss this genre in my life? Um, so I started writing them, not out of any seriousness, just being playful, you know, numbering them, poem number one, poem number two, and I got up to a hundred. And then I think by, by a hundred, I started recognizing what it was I was trying to write about. What is this really about? Um, uh, but mostly I think it, it taught me how to play around with images and language, which defined then my, my essays. Um, so these poems have been written over mm, at least a decade, you know, and then to take them seriously, I put them in a folder. And then I had so many at one time, I thought I uh, showed them to Sarah and we started putting them together in this way. Another thing that I've noticed as I was uh, putting this talk together was that there is another theme here, and it's the theme of divisions which I think is sort of common for army brats. You know, there's the civilian world, there's the military world, there's the private and the public, the male, the female, uh, the internal, the external, the forgetting and memory. Um, and I thought, wow, that's, it, it shows up. So I'm gonna start, the book's divided into three sections and I'm gonna start with the first section, um, a poem I thought was appropriate because it starts uh, called um, At an Early Age. And I think this subject is a subject I started paying attention to at an early age. Um, yeah, so anyway, here it is. And at an early age, I watched men parachute from planes and women read the future from empty palms. I learned how fathers depart in the middle of the night with rucksacks and guns, while mothers linger at the window, shifting the weight of loneliness like a toddler from one hip to the other. I whispered prayers for the world to say solid, but when the war blew my father into pieces difficult to find, the limits of language rested on a foggy horizon. For a lifetime, I've brushed up against those borders, picked at scabs of history. I've paused some nights in dimly lit rooms at the breaking point, searching for words in the margins those out of bound conversations. I also have to add that at an early age, I lived in Europe post uh, World War II, and there were still many signs of the world, of the war. Um, for instance, bombed out buildings and still in rubbles in Munich. Uh, I had to boil our water because of typhoid. Um, yeah, on and on. So it was something that I, that I paid attention to. Um, I've been working for 20 years um, on a book about my mother. And obviously it's a 
tough one to write because it's 20 years later and I still haven't written it. I put it away, I take it out. So there are a few poems in here about her. Um, I discovered also in putting this together how, well, in writing some of these poems, how mythological the topic of war is. I mean, people have written about the archetypes and the subjects forever and ever, um, as far back as we can imagine. And here I am in the 21st century still addressing um, this subject. So in the title of this next poem, I included Shakespeare's characters. It's called Hero in Khaki, Sounding Like Othello Wooing Desdemona. It's on page six if anyone has the book and interested in following. While soldiers do push-ups on parade grounds and sign papers of mission first, my mother hangs diapers on community clotheslines at Smoke Bomb Hill, picnics on a rifle range, parachute silk turned into bedspreads, men rarely out of uniform. A soldier's pay will have to do, my father writes her from the language school in Monterey. She drinks coffee in trailer parks with other wives, all of them waiting for payday, deployment, mail, promises disappear with her black eye, rubbed like polish my father brushed into his boots, assurances stored with the bedroom gun collection. One night at the enlisted men's club, she takes that first drink and never returns, crazy as that sounds. With each swallow, hope travels over the fortress walls to some dance she always imagined, some place she wants to call home, some peace. Off and on, in my childhood, I lived with a grandmother in New Jersey, uh, especially if my dad was gone to Vietnam. Um, so this is a poem about the time I was 13, living with her. And you know, one of the things I think the reason I keep writing is because I really, as an army brat and as a female, I felt like I had no voice, nor did I want one for a long time. But uh, it's very important to me at this stage of life. Uh, so this was really about a very confused 13 year old without, without a voice um, in Northern New Jersey. So by the way, now that I've gotten much older, I so appreciate the difficulty my grandmother must have had taking care of three, three uh, young girls, um, no small task. Anyway, here it is. Consider this one small corner in New Jersey. Get your head out of the gutter, Grandma yelled, as I sat on the curb down the street, the furthest I could go without running away. I could smell autumn coming soon in Mr. Metzger's backyard. Hear the story again about how he'd lost his son, Billy, back in the second big war. His chained dog ran a path under a maple with whales. I couldn't stuff into my pocket like the dollar bills my father sent and grandma folded into her brassiere. Think of what your father goes through over there in the jungle, she continued, as though that might make being 13 easier, less difficult for her to care for us, maybe losing her son. Get your head out of the gutter, she repeated, louder this time. And I thought she meant to stand up straight, model civility for my sisters, playing with Barbie dolls on her front porch near fading rose bushes. While grandma swept dirt off the stone walk, I should have let the dog loose. I should have picked up my small head and glued it back on. Oddly, I, for lack of a better word, oddly, my dad was killed on my mother's birthday in the first day of spring. And there's something about that coming together of those three things that has always, always given me pause. And I've tried to make sense of it. There is no sense, but um, yeah, this thought of the convergence of death, life, a new season. Um, yeah. Anyway, this poem uh, deals with that. And it, it mentions something about a cake, making a cake. It was my sister who made the cake, Janice, not me. Anyway, I want to give her credit in case she's watching. Um, crossfire. On a country road across from cornfields and cattle, soybeans and sunshine, a daughter bakes her mother a birthday cake, then swings on the front porch to music moving in from far off St. Louis. 
The clock of long afternoons continues to tick beyond the spring flowers planted inside a tractor tire in the yard, and warm winds trace patterns in the clouds, here and then gone, their lives already dissolved, drifting over the shoulders of men with rifles raised, crossing a river, grenades, split-second decisions. A father placed piece by piece into a plastic bag until the sting of the sun sneaks out of the jungle so that one day out of a year, these memories of death and birth entwine like slender snakes, finding each other off a worn path. In a photograph never taken, man and woman stand together in fields of rice, rubber trees, and birthday cakes with blue frosting. Light rays refract, then converge on one calendar day as they pass through the same realm. I hope you're thinking of questions because I've left time for that at some point. Um, so I'm going to go into the second se uh, section now. Um, and this poem also deals with division. Uh, my senior year in high school, I lived with an aunt and uncle. Um, and my uncle was clearly a civilian um, working for CBS in New York. And he bought this old green car, the BGC, we called it the big green Chevy. And my job was sometimes to drive him to the train station so he could go into New York uh, and then drop the, the little kids off at their schools. So this is called Split Frame. Comes out of that memory. Some mornings, my uncle put on his coat in the flagstone hallway and called out to those left at the breakfast table, illegitimi non carborundum, then clicked his heels like Dorothy off to the land of Oz. Don't let the bastards grind you down. Other mornings, I drove him to the train station where I sat in our old green Chevy, watching him wait with the other men, dressed in suits and ties, out of shea cases, folded New York Times under their arms. The scene suddenly split to a frame of tiger-striped soldiers waiting on the runway, their rucksacks and weapons ready for the long flight ahead. The factions of a nation alive, rendered from each other like fat from soup. Everywhere I look, the world divided, a double feature showing simultaneously in the same theater. Uh, this next poem in sec the second section is called um, A Daughter's Wish, and it also addresses that male-female kind of split. Um, sort of, I was playing around with uh, jealousy of my dad and, um, and pride all at the same time. Um, yeah, there was one other thing I was gonna tell you about that. Uh, yeah, maybe it'll come to me. Um, yeah, daughter's wish. And maybe trying, I've been accused of being so serious in my writing, but I always say, yeah, but I'm a happy person. Um, so, I was trying to play around a little bit here with humor. A daughter's wish. Oh, I know what I was gonna say. I'm always talking about, oh, that book won the Pulitzer Prize, and that book won the Pulitzer Prize. And one day I thought, what is it with this Pulitzer Prize thing? And I thought, oh, it's kind of like the Medal of Honor of Literature. And my father received the Medal of Honor uh, posthumously. And so maybe I think that's the connection. Anyway, here it is, a, a daughter's wish. I wish I'd gotten the Medal of Honor, the Pulitzer of War, so I might leave behind a generation of admirers with a gymnasium and street named after me, a museum for my stuff. I wish whole platoons would visit my grave bearing flags and trumpets, rain or shine, someone to brush off the snow on my stone. I wish someone would tell stories about Remember when, and yeah, she was one fine soldier. I wish, like the sparrows resting on top of that wall of names, I might keep the dead company, might listen to the sonorous sounds of crowds gathered to recollect and leave something behind as a gift. I'm wondering at this point if anyone has questions or um, 
I'm gonna take a little break before I move on. Hi. <laughs> she knows that voice. You know, I'm just um, moved by your poetry and I'm thinking about what's going on in the world and mm. it reminds me of the 60s. It reminds me how you talked about college and how you could never really um, be prideful of your father because what was going on. And, um, and that's just something my thought is on. It's not a question, honey, it's just a thought. No, I think you're right though. I think everything has its time. You know, the, the country is um, interested in the subject. I think we've had a, a generation or two in between. Um, I remember uh, one of my teachers, uh, first essay teacher, yeah, first essay teacher, Judith Kitchen, um, and I eventually was in a writing group with her. She has since died, but she talked about how one, someone she'd gone to high school with, she was at a bar, and he had been in Vietnam, uh, and he came back, and she turned her back to him. Mm -hmm. And all these years later, she says, who the hell was I? This man is raising his three little children. He has done his country duty, and who am I? You know, but it took, you know, I'm talking like two decades later, she is suddenly like, oh my God, that wasn't right, you know? So sometimes it takes some distance, you know, time and time. Um, yeah, and maybe now with the way things are in the country, we're sort of looking at ourselves like, yeah, you know, in many ways, not just about race, but just how we judge and et cetera, et cetera. All right, well, I um, just want to give you one comment that's in the chat box in case you can't see it, Gail. It's from Mandy who says this, not a question, but wanted to say that she's a diplomatic brat, didn't live in the US till she was 18 and is halfway through Snake's Daughter. Oh, and she goodness. says, your writing is hitting a deep, deep chord. Oh, thank you. And, nice yes. to know. And yeah. then there is a question from Pamela. So Pamela, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you can certainly do that. Oh, or I can read it for you. She said she's got a little bronchitis. Oh, so. oh Pam Ferdinand. <laughs> oh, hi, Pam. <laughs> All right. So her, she says, such a beautiful and deep work, Gail. I'm wondering how you've marked your father's death on that day, your mother's birthday, over the years, and how that has changed. Well, God, I'm a different person. I think in those days... You know, all I wanted to do was run away and uh, pull the shade down and not talk about it and, um, and not deal with grief. I mean, so that was quite a long time ago. Um, and now, you know, maybe because of writing essays. Writing essays for me is a lot about making connections. You know, you pull these three things out of the sky and they're like, oh yeah, they kind of go together. And, and this is material that I, that I would use, the irony, you know, of, of spring and, and, and uh, wondering like why of all days, you know, that day and um, yeah, and how, how that day stays in my body, which I find interesting. The head is like, you know, some, some years you think, um, you have to be reminded like from a sister or something like, yeah, this is the day and uh, what they call in Yiddish, the yard site, the time of the year. Um, and then I think, oh yeah, I'll light a candle. Uh, but, uh, but it does stay in the body and I've had that experience. Uh, in fact, I wrote a poem about it. Maybe I'll, I'll get to it um, of having things just click like, oh yeah, it doesn't go away, it doesn't go away. So I don't know if that helps, Pam, but yeah. She says okay. yes. I see it. Yeah, thank okay, you. Okay, good. All right. Should I get back or do we have more? Um, well, I just wanted to say one thing. As I was listening um, to you read, you know, I really loved that view that you presented about the split frame. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I tried to write this quote down because I don't have your book in front of me, but the one where you write about the split frame and light waves refract and converge into this one realm. Yeah. And, you know, all of your poetry 
you've just created such beautiful imagery. And I think, you know, that's part of it. Like you're, it, it seems like you have a very um, cinematic visual view of the world. And so in turn, you give us these wonderful images in your poetry. And <clears throat> I also wanted to say that I love how you introduced it, that, you know, you didn't even think about writing poetry until you started kind of playing with it. And there's a, a woman named Sarah Lewis who wrote a book called The Rise. It's all about creativity. Mm. And she, she talks about how play is a huge part of creativity mm -hmm. and that we think that it, it's, you know, silly and whatnot, but it often results in um, some amazing projects and some amazing discoveries. So I thought that was really cool. Well, sort of high, low stakes, playful. You know, I would write it, put, throw it in. Um, and some nights, the night before, I would just make a list of words, um, pulled at random, and then I'd say, I have to use these words tomorrow. And I love the challenge of it. I think if I had said, okay, now I'm gonna become a poet and I'm gonna work towards a book, it, it wouldn't have gotten written, you know? So yeah, play is important, I think you're right. Um, all right, so back in 2003, my sisters and I went to Vietnam with a grassroots organization called Sons and Daughters in Touch. And it turns out it's the only time that group went, so I'm so glad. At first I wasn't gonna go because I had written a book about my dad and I'd researched all stuff about Vietnam and I was sort of sick of the subject and I thought, ah, I know everything there is to know, why do I need to go? And it was gonna be expensive and all that. But then when my sisters were going, I thought, well, I'm not, they're not going without me. So I'm so, so glad I went. Um, this is a grassroots organization started by Tony, hmm, I can't remember his name, last name, uh, whose father had died in Vietnam and they never found his father. And he started this organization with grown children, we're all grown up, you know, who's still dealing with that war. And we went to visit the, the, um, the country, we were there three weeks. We brought along a priest, a nun, nurses, uh, retired uh, special forces colonels. Um, and then when we got there, we divided into uh, groups, color groups, and the group you were in had to do with the area where your father was killed. And we, they, I think they took like three years to research um, the battle details and the, the geographic location of where each death was. And we went with our group to each place and we held services. Um, and we brought the Vietnamese with us and uh, it was a very powerful experience. So this poem comes out of that time in Hanoi which, you know, growing up, teenage years, thought that was the enemy. Um, and there we were in Hanoi. It was a bit scary at first, um, just because of everything that, you know, I had, well, had, had thought about during that time, during the war. Um, so this is an, from an experience I had buying a, a CD about Elvis. And my mother loved Elvis, had every one of his records, went to all his movies. So it, it popped out. And so anyway, that's what this poem's about. Elvis in Hanoi. In Hanoi, when I try to buy two bootleg Elvis CDs with American cash, the vendor shakes his head no, points to his missing arm. In the narrow space between rows of music, discs slipped into sleeves. He motions for me to sit on a red stool while my sisters hand him dung and we calculate the exchange. I want to tell him about my mother's love for Elvis, how she danced to Heartbreak Hotel and Are You Lonesome Tonight? I want to ask what he thinks of Elvis. I want him to know about my father whose footprints disappeared by a river in the south but that won't bring back his missing arm or my father. I want suddenly to reach out, touch his remaining arm, a gesture of understanding, some penance for what I did not do. Two strangers study each other under the tropical sun, find the vanishing point, currency, Elvis, this red stool for resting. And the last poem from this section, it's on page 36, it's called Scoreboard. 
And I thought about this, you know, I'm always seeing men about that age uh, in wheelchairs. And I often wonder about like their story, you know, I mean, that's the writer in me. But so I imagined them as Vietnam vets. And that's what this came out of um, scoreboard. What would God say about those legless men sitting straight in their wheelchairs, combat pay in their pockets, splintered souls who roll by downtown, or the ones tossing a ball from chair to chair with calloused palms, their wild arms thrusting upward for points? Would he notice the choreogra choreography of shots, explosions of voices, the names screamed in the crowd? Would he hear the crash of metal against metal, wheels screeching across smooth planks as the gym eventually hushes? Would God know where to find the missing legs? And how would he handle two dead Iraqis traded for one American, one set of camis for two Dishdasha? Would he consider the call for evening devotions bursting with century-long ceremony? less important than the chaplain bowing his head before a pair of empty boots? Or would he gather all those men and toss each a ball they must pass around, like some kind of sacrament, some gesture of shared language, the body needing the catch and then the throw, always a team effort? When the game is over and the coach blows the whistle, would God finally give over the missing legs, like souvenirs sold at the game or a prize for trying their best? So this next one comes from the, thir the third section, and it's a prose poem. I try to play around with different styles. You know, we can get stuck in our, our own way. Um, so interesting, though, this this what I call a prose poem was published in um, in an anthology called uh, Sarah Knows. She was in it also. Uh, one, nothing short of 100. It has exactly 100 words. So, you know, you're counting like this to make sure. Anyway, it was accepted, but I think of it very much as a prose poem. Uh, it's called War Never Ends. And it comes based on a dream that, uh, I don't know if it was a repetitive dream, but a dream that I had. Night after night, I swoop up tiny tetras in the shower. I carry them to safety, and they swim out of my grown-up hands. In the morning, it's still 1967, with the wretched work of war's dragons, forsaken imprints of my mother's red lipstick, a famine in her kitchen with a vinyl pocketbook of failure come down through the years. Night after night, I want to show her the saved fish. Instead, I watch men on the sidelines count the fish, string them up, brag about the size and weight, then throw their bones away. Um, what page is this on? Page, oh, here it is. Um, this is another poem, this next poem, about division. And it started, I started thinking about it when I was teaching at Rochester Institute of Technology for about 15 years, and every fall or spring, I can't remember, I think it was freshmen, of course, everything's blamed on freshmen, but freshmen would come in playing this game where they had bandanas around their head, they had fake guns, uh, they were teams, and they would come into class, you know, as like they're in fifth grade, and slide the guns under the chair, and I would, just stare at them. Once in a while I'd ask a question like, what's the game about? And I don't know. Uh, it always struck me as like an odd thing to be doing at college. But it says, I've got to say, I'm sick of government cars arriving with god awful news, soldiers dying while the rest of the country shops at the mall. I'm sick of all those signs support our troops. I'm sick of the concept, them and us. Like the silly war games my students play, peering around corners and their fake weapons tucked under chairs to cl in classes someone else pays for, grown children with bandanas across their foreheads. I'm sick of that next black car arriving, the drums that keep beating. 
Um, this next poem is, an, is another prose poem, and it's all, if you notice, it's all one sentence. This, this was also published, but not as a prose poem, um, but I think of it as a prose poem. It's one sentence, and I wrote it when I came back from Fort Bragg, which won't be Fort Bragg for long, um, when my father was, uh, asked, well asked, he wasn't around, but asked to be in the, re the regiment uh, for the special forces. And so they, they made a big deal about it. The family flew down, we stayed in hotel, um, we had a, a, our own private guide. Um, so this is written when I get back from, from that, that weekend. It's called Distinguished Member of the Regiment. It's late and I'm home, but I'm also at Fort Bragg, still on that stage, shaking the Colonel's hand after he hands me the medal around my neck in honor of my dead father, now gone 50 years. And his eyes stare at me with tenderness or what might have been pity, which makes me think he wished he'd known my dad, whose picture projects on a screen for the audience to see while someone reads the details of his heroic soldier death. And here where the night tight ticks slowly by. I'm also still thinking of Glenn Lane, who looked tall and strong and young in the black and white photograph he handed me at the reception after the ceremony of his special forces team in Vietnam back in probably 1966, with my dad kneeling in the front row and Glenn standing in the back wearing what my father called tiger stripes and how he told me he'd been wounded two days before my father was killed, but that no one told him for a month because they were afraid he might never recover then. And how suddenly he's in his 80s, no longer a soldier. And I'm lying here, states away, wishing I had said something worthwhile to him since he'd sought me out to give me a copy of this picture. But all I did was listen, but not enough because the crowd was noisy and the southern sun so bright and my son and daughter-in-law, who never met my father, stood nearby watching with curiosity. And I didn't want them to leave my side while the round bronze medal draped with a green ribbon around my neck and my body partly disassociated to a place where it's okay to put things on hold while you figure out exactly what you think about all this and won't have to realize yet that this honorable gathering will pass quickly like our lives and the crowd will disappear sooner rather than later and it will be too soon too late to speak to everyone you'd hoped you would but life moves that way and sometimes like tonight you want to pull back the past like bed covers and slow it down so you can be there again i mean really be there so like life for a child it will last forever and so will your father Um, the other poem, and then if you have questions would be good. Um, yeah, remember I said sometimes it stays in your body and, and your mind, it's like gone. Um, it's not every year like that, but this is a poem written, um, it was an odd day, it was towards the end of the semester, and I went to my class and another teacher was in there and I insisted, no, this is my classroom. No, it was his. And so I went down to the secretary's office and made a big huff and puff about it. And she says, no, he's right. You got the wrong hour. So I thought, oh, I wonder what that's about. So here it is, <laughs> spring, comma, again. I arrive at the wrong hour to find another teacher in the room. So much confusion this time of the semester. At the right hour, I face the board write the date, first day of spring, another blustery March. In midair, my hand pauses, my back to the class, my breath recognizes what the mind forgets. My father's rations in a can, his children waiting in Illinois where no one speaks of war, a knock on the door with official papers, a purple heart, the cuckoo clock strikes, ticks, my little brother sits on my mother's lap, open your books, be sure to take notes. I mean, it just sort of clicked. I thought, ah, that's why I'm just not totally here. Um, 
And then one last one. I mean, I can read more, but um, before we ask maybe some questions. Um, this is, I think, a poem, if I had to guess, it's called In the Therapist's Office, which already tells you I was in therapy, of course. Uh, but I think it's how many years I really had to work at finding this sorrow and trauma uh, on many layers inside my body. You know, it's one thing to write about it and, and um, sort of take notes, but it's another thing to actually uh, find that kind of trauma and actually even to label it trauma. Um, so that's what I think this is, Paul. And it's, um, I wrote it for Lisa in the therapist's office. What's been cracked open holds further nightmares that spread like disturbances in the field. Suddenly, all of history's indignities circle the silence. Death lies dense on the tongue and deep in the bones. As you wander the streets of res, res, res excuse me, resuscitated, I don't know what that's about. Anyway, resuscitated goats, ghosts, and dare them to dance their wild and tangled thunderstorms, while the blues of pleading songs wind their way through this war and that. When pale adolescent girls review piles of body bags ready for their flight home, you are sure to run from anything, even with small stones in your hands, even as the wind pulls birds through the air and leaves you with a bundle of black feathers, a pine cone, morning doves speaking from a neighbor's tree. You double back on this trail, listening to the howls of your breathing, the moon rising again and lingering over burial mounds, then kissing the space between the leaf empty trees, the earth so ready for penance and relief. Search for the trail that leads across the sky, then down through your heart and belly and toes. Pause for a long while to find the rage in your fists, to study shudders along your spine. Feel a river moving inside your chest. And just where the land rises over the horizon, touch the moss on every tree as drum sounds lead the way forward out of the dark forest. When the body swells again with pain, the goddess turns you like a compass towards praise. So I thought maybe it'd be a good time also to take a break if anyone has questions. I'm sorry, oh, I keep forgetting to unmute there. myself. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so while I share a little bit about my thoughts, please everyone feel free to drop your name in the comments if you've got comments or questions. Um, First of all, wow, you, um, your poems are really powerful and they give us, for me anyway, so much to consider. Um, Sarah had written a comment, I don't know if you saw it, just saying that, you know, she's familiar with your work and the extra layer of um, enjoyment and just hearing you read those poems out loud. Oh, thank you. Which is so true. Um, it just adds to the richness of the work when you get to hear the author read. And that's partly why I love doing these kinds of events too, because I probably wouldn't get to hear you read live otherwise. Right. Not so Milwaukee. far away. No. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I would be missing so much. So, oh. um, yeah, it, it just, you've given us so much to think about. Um, I really loved that poem scoreboard. And um, for me, reasons to look at things, a different angle, and to un understand things differently. And that's the whole point of why we read so much of it. And uh, so I really appreciate your work. And if there is someone, I can see a bunch of things popping up here in the comments if you want to read them. Gail, yeah, I while you're... See, I can see okay. down. Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, if there's anyone else who would like to just openly share... You can certainly do that. You can unmute yourself if you want to and just pop in and say something. Hello, Gail. This is Bob. Oh, Bob Shea, who went to Bennington as well. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Kate. And I just want to comment because, of course, I'm familiar with your work, your prose, and your poetry. And I think today, listening to you read and the range of, of the text, of the book, 
that you put together reminds me of how time is not linear, but no. circular. <laughs> and how you've brought that so richly together throughout this sections of retrieval. And um, I feel, uh, how to say, lucky hmm. to, know, to know you, to have learned from you, and to share this part of our lives together beyond Bennington. Well, thank you. Yeah, one is writers are always looking for literary pals and Bob has been one of those over the years post Bennington. Um, you know, someone else who cares about essays and images and, and all of that. We become quite precious. Yeah, thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to pop in real quick? Hey, Gail. I'll pop. Oh, no. Yes. Okay. This is, pop in. this is Denise. I'm looking at the one I've got to say. Um, oh. Just, um, you know, and I guess you're thinking of all the games that people play and video games on war. And, um, and, you're go and you're the reality. You're the, you know, the government car coming to tell uh, yeah. the reality of war. And uh, it's a, it's an amazing uh, imagery gown. Oh, thank you, Denise. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's when you were saying that, I was thinking of this other poem that I'm going to read, and um, even language that's used. Um, I was thinking back in 2003 when that group, you know, that Sons and Daughters in Touch, when we went to Vietnam, we were waiting in the Singapore airport when um, the Iraqi war started, ironically. Uh, and it was on CNN, you know, the television up there. And um, anyway, I'll read it. It deals with, well, even how the language itself um, gets complicated, you know, and what triggers things. It's called, he says war again. At the Singapore airport on our way home from the, to the world of the big, big PX, after three weeks in Vietnam, sons and daughters stand in line with what our fathers would have called at ease. I watch Cindy from Ohio fiddle with her baby bracelet taken off her dead father in the Oshaw Valley and siblings from Texas with an MIA father. The president on the TV behind us announces the Iraq war, sitting in his office and talking like he's telling us that even though we thought school was over, we'd have to go back and start again. Sacrifices will have to be made. History moves over us like a thousand tiny ghosts. Words like decisive force and military families praying caught in the back of my throat. Absurdity fading from bright red to pale pink to no color at all. I look out the narrow windows along a row of purple orchids, a fat sun inside a red haze. Soon helicopters will again swoop up the wounded and dead, tracers and bombs, machine guns and bodies. You've seen it in the movies. Another battle never completely resolved. It's 30 years to the month that the last combat troops returned from Vietnam, and I am 53 years old, still considering the immeasurable miles between home and outpost, still tinkering with invisible pieces of war. Voices over the intercom assure us all the planes will arrive on time. So of course, I'm trying to deal with irony there, you know, uh, yours, mine, and ours, um, and how casually President Bush, at least I thought, said those kind of words. And I thought, if he could just be in line with us right now, he might change his mind. But anyway, he didn't. Thank you, Gail. There are a couple more questions. I think one from sure. John and then Mandy. Okay. And then um, there's a question from Howard after that. So we'll start with John. Okay. Okay, actually, it's Janice. It's um, oh, my sister. My sister, yes. I need that voice anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> I just just wanted to say how much I appreciate listening to you read, um, and uh, I've always loved writing. In fact, I have you know folders full of them of your writing. Um, 
so many shared experiences and, and the way you uh, present things just helped me a great deal as well. Oh, that's nice to hear, Janice. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, Mandy, would you like to go ahead? Do we lose Mandy? She needs to unmute. Sorry, I was on mute, and um, oh. yeah, I was, I was, <laughs> I was just saying I was reluctant to show myself because I'm in my painting clothes and I have pandemic hair, as a friend of mine calls oh. it. But I'm the one that grew uh, is a diplomatic. Right, guy. right, right. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I was just wondering. I know you writing. I mean, I just know about your poems, and then I'm, I'm reading Snake's Daughters, which is divided into you know small essays for the mm -hmm. most part, and I'm just wondering if that you know, fragmented kind of childhood lends itself to that oh, form. Definitely, 100%. And it's interesting also, it only occurred to me this past year that, and I, I, uh, I wrote a short piece about it actually, um, for this book I'm writing about my mom. Yeah, I think everything I've ever done in my life is done in short pieces. I'm, I'm a quilt maker, a collage maker, um, I write those short pieces. My poems are short. Uh, I think, I mean, I use the metaphor of like life breaking apart and feeling like my job in life is to put the pieces together mm -hmm. again and uh, to create something beautiful out of something that isn't beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so it occurred to me that, wow, this is how I approach it all. Um, and maybe it also has to do with how much I can hold in my head. And like in Snake's Daughter, I used photographs. So, I mean, you know, that alone is a small piece. Um, yeah. yeah, no, good observation. Thank you. Yeah, and, and you know, you know too from moving around a lot, you only get, to, well, I don't know about, uh, my dad was an enlisted man, so, you know, at the bottom of at the bottom there, so you didn't get to take very much with you, and you had to choose constantly what's important, what can I leave behind, what can I take with me, uh, what do I love, what do I don't need, you know, and that's also about pieces, I think. Yeah, I've, I've been working with homeless people and creative writing workshops for about 20 years, mm -hmm. and I've always wanted to kind of put those experiences together, but it seems impossible because really I was so privileged and um but the minute i walked into the homeless shelter i felt at home which is ironic and probably not no really it's not actually, correct yeah someone who moves around all the time i mean yeah. it, in a way it's another form of homelessness yeah yeah but and i you know didn't have i don't have the socioeconomic aspect of that no of course not but that's still the the concept you know yeah. of where is home mm -hmm. um yeah well thank you Oh, you're welcome. Um, I have, I thought I would read one other poem that includes both my parents and very old, from an old, very old photograph, probably in the 50s, maybe before I was born, I don't know. It's called um, Mercury, Patron God of Travelers. And maybe, Mandy, this sort of fits, well, I don't know about fits your life, but that concept of traveling. My father gets out of his black Mercury so shiny, I can see my reflection even now. Everything but his love filled with elegance and skill. Hermes returned. Shirt sleeves rolled up, blue tattoos on his forearms buried beneath his blonde hair. One day in a jungle, these ink images identify his body. But for now, the engine runs and my mother climbs out the other side, barely 19. They stand under a brilliant sun, as if waiting for the future they already know is unsettled, waiting for me to offer help to the underworld. It's warm, always warm, with more children to raise. To the right, a big field with possibilities they don't see, a fence they can't climb, rows of farmer seeds ready to burst open. The sound of an erratic train runs parallel as I wave my magic wand a caduceus with its entwined snakes over these now departed souls, me, the conductor of the dead. I, I feel like I'm taking, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. That no, last I just, one sort of refers, I feel 
I don't know why there's a sense of responsibility. Maybe I was, I'm the oldest child, who knows? Anyway, I'm, sorry. I'm taking up too much time, but I just wanted to point out one line in Snake's Daughter that um, it reminded me, this poem reminded me, is about your dad getting into a plane and one world shuts off and the next one shut, you know, turns on with the AC yeah. and yeah. Anyway, so I'm, yeah, I'm done now, you. but thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, it's, it's nice to hear because I wrote that so long ago. It's sometimes oh. hard to remember. Did I really even do that? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Gail. Um, I know that Howard had a question real quick. So Howard, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you're welcome to. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. First of all, I want to thank you, Gail, and also you, Christy, for making this possible. Um, this is my second of these events, and, and as someone said earlier, a chance to hear you read poetry that none of us otherwise would have. And, mm, and so thank, thank you. you both. Um, my, my question is your, your poetry is so, um, the images are so vivid and real, and, and everything is so emotional. Mm. Uh, could you offer any advice for a 60 something who has taken an interest in reading and writing poetry rather late in life hmm. with no formal training in writing other than technical writing? Sure, well, writing is writing, you know, for starters, technical is good, um, language. I think, I mean, I feel like I came late to life poetry. I mean, I was in my 40s, but still, um, I think, as many teachers of mine have said, read, read, read poetry, go to poetry readings, take a class, uh, just keep working at it and, and not to get too excited about publishing right away. You know, I mean, putting, putting them as you write them in a folder, um, that's my suggestion, and just bringing them out when you feel like I don't feel like starting something new, but I want to work at this. And then, you know, a period of a few months, you step back and you think, oh, well, that's not what I'm really trying to say, or what word would be better, or I've used this word twice, or, you know, those small things that kind of, um, and then they grow that way, sort of organically. Um, I mean, I took even last winter, I took a class from a friend who was teaching a graduate um, a workshop, and I said, can I, can I just sit in? And he said, well, but I don't want to grade papers. I said, I don't want to write any papers. I just want to listen. And, you know, I got introduced to poets, young poets that I wouldn't pick up necessarily. And I learned an incredible amount. Um, you know, that just, I mean, that's the thing I love about writing is that unlike tennis, you know, you can only do for so many years in your life, writing you can do forever. I mean, you just, and not necessarily to become get the Pulitzer Prize, back to that, but to, um, to work with language and images and to, to try to get at truth and to get it as right as you can. That's my goal at this old age. And it's a challenge and it's, um, it's worth getting up for in the morning. So mm -hmm. I think it, you know, 60 is like nada, you know, just keep, keep doing it. Thank you. All right, and I see Elizabeth has a quick question as well. You can go ahead, Elizabeth. Hi, Gail. Oh, other sister. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I come up as this phantom and my, my face isn't there. But um, anyway, I just want to thank you. And uh, I was on the other Zoom when you spoke your poems, but uh, it's nice to, to listen to you today. And I just want to um, just to thank you and say that um, I'm really grateful that you found the words to say it. Oh, thank you, Betty Ann. Thank you. And I had you in mind in case you did show up on this one. So I tried yeah. to read other poems that I hadn't read last time. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Try to make it interesting. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that the time goes so fast when you're having fun here. It does. It yeah. Does. Thank you so much, Gail, for all of this, for the reading and um, all of your words of wisdom and um, you know, sharing some of the stories behind the poems. It's just been a wonderful hour, a wonderful experience oh, to be thanks. with you. Thank you. Um, again, to all of you who are here, I appreciate you showing up on a Sunday afternoon. It's wonderful to have you. 
I've dropped the links again into the chat box one more time for you to check out Gail's website and to uh, look at, at Main Street Rag Press where you can purchase her book. And um, I hope you'll check out hiddentimberbooks.com again and come to some of our other readings. We've got more coming up that I'm super excited about. It's just wonderful to be able to connect with everyone online. So um, yeah, thanks so Thank much. You. Thank you again. Thank you. Good. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for showing up.